Hi everyone, happy Banned Books Week, and welcome to Books on the Chopping Block. Thank you so much for tuning in to celebrate our freedom to read and the importance of the First Amendment. My name is Katie Nielsen, and I have been doing this program with City Lit Theatre Company for 14 years. We started the program back in 2006 with a series of readings from books that had been removed from the curriculum of a local school district. From there, we started our long-standing relationship with the American Library Association, presenting dramatic readings by professional actors from the most challenged books in the country. A book challenge is defined as a formal written complaint filed with a library or school requesting that materials be removed due to their content or appropriateness. The following presentations are from the top 10 most frequently challenged books in the United States. Book number 10, And Tango Makes Three, is a children's book written by Justin Richardson and Peter Parnell and illustrated by Henry Cole. This ALA notable children's book published in 2005 has been challenged and relocated for containing LGBTQIA content. In the middle of New York City, there is a great big park called Central Park. Children love to play there. It has a toy boat pond where they can sail their boats. Best of all, it has its very own zoo. Every day, families of all kinds go to visit the animals that live there. But the children and their parents aren't the only families at the zoo. The animals make families of their own. There are red panda bear families with mothers and fathers and furry red panda bear cubs. There are monkey dads and monkey moms raising noisy monkey babies. And in the penguin house, there are penguin families. Every year, at the very same time, the girl penguins start noticing the boy penguins, and the boy penguins start noticing the girls. When the right girl and the right boy find each other, they become a couple. Two penguins in the penguin house were a little bit different. One was named Roy, and the other was named Silo. Roy and Silo were both boys but they did everything together. They didn't spend much time with the girl penguins, and the girl penguins didn't spend much time with them. Instead, Roy and Silo wound their necks around each other. Their keeper, Mr. Gramsci, noticed the two penguins and thought to himself, they must be in love. Roy and Silo watched how the other penguins made a home, so they built a nest of stones for themselves. Every night, Roy and Silo slept there together just like the other penguin couples. And every morning, Roy and Silo woke up together. But one day, Roy and Silo saw that the other couples could do something they could not. The mama penguin would lay an egg. She and the papa penguin would take turns keeping the egg warm until finally it would hatch. And then there would be a baby penguin. Roy and Silo had no egg to sit on and keep warm. They had no baby chick to feed and cuddle and love. One day, Roy found something that looked like what the other penguins were hatching, and he brought it to their nest. It was only a rock, but Silo carefully sat on it and sat and sat. Day after day, Silo and Roy sat on the rock, but nothing happened. Then Mr. Gramsci got an idea. He found an egg that needed to be cared for, and he brought it to Roy and Silo's nest. Roy and Silo knew just what to do. They moved the egg to the center of their nest. Every day they turned it, so each side stayed warm. Some days, Roy sat while Silo went for food. Other days, it was Silo's turn to take care of the egg. They sat in the morning, and they sat at night. Until one day, they heard a sound coming from inside their egg. Peep, 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 it said. Roy and Silo called back. Squawk, squawk. Peep, peep, answered the egg. Suddenly, a tiny hole appeared in the egg's shell. And then, crack! Out came their very own baby. She had fuzzy white feathers and a funny black beak. Now Roy and Silo were fathers. We'll call her Tango, Mr. Gramsci decided, because it takes two to make a tango. Roy and Silo taught Tango how to sing for them when she was hungry. They fed her food from their beaks. 
they snuggled in their nest at night. Tango was the very first penguin in the zoo to have two daddies. Soon, Tango grew strong enough to leave the nest. Roy and Silo took her for a swim, just like the other penguin families. And all the children who came to the zoo could see Tango and her two fathers playing in the penguin house with the other penguins. Hooray, Roy! Hooray, Silo! Welcome, Tango, they cheered. At night, the three penguins returned to their nest. There they snuggled together, and like all the other penguins in the penguin house, and all the other animals in the zoo, and all the families in the big city around them, they went to sleep. Book number nine. Harry Potter is a series of seven fantasy novels written by British author J.K. Rowling. We would be remiss here not to mention the controversy surrounding Ms. Rowling's comments and her perspective on trans rights and the irony of her appearing on this list alongside so many books that celebrate trans youth. It is our belief that censorship, even of problematic material or authors, is a threat to an educated democracy and that spotlighting issues rather than sweeping them under the rug promotes important discussion. The Harry Potter series has been banned and forbidden for referring to magic and witchcraft, for containing actual curses and spells, and for characters that use, quote, nefarious means to attain goals. Harry had no idea how long a bath he would need to work out the secret of the golden egg, so he decided to do it at night when he would be able to take as much time as he wanted. Everything was made of white marble, including what looked like an empty rectangular swimming pool sunk into the middle of the floor. About a hundred golden taps stood all around the pool's edges. How on earth was this supposed to help solve the mystery of the egg? Nevertheless, he knelt down and turned on a few of the taps. He could tell at once that they carried different sorts of bubble bath mixed with the water, though it wasn't bubble bath that Harry had ever experienced it. One tap gushed pink and blue bubbles the size of footballs. When the deep pool was full of hot water, foam, and bubbles, Harry turned off all the taps, pulled off his pajamas, slippers, and dressing gown, and slid into the water. Highly enjoyable though it was to swim in hot and foamy water, no stroke of brilliance came to him, no sudden burst of understanding. Harry stretched out his arms, lifted the egg in his wet hands, and opened it. The wailing, screeching sound filled the bathroom, echoing and reverberating off the marble walls, but it sounded just as incomprehensible as ever. He snapped it shut again, and then, making him jump so badly that he dropped the egg, which clattered away across the bathroom floor, someone spoke. I'd try putting it in the water if I were you. Harry had swallowed a considerable amount of bubbles in shock. <laughs> he stood up sputtering and saw the ghost of a very glum-looking girl sitting cross-legged on top of one of the taps. It was moaning Myrtle who was usually to be heard sobbing in the S-bend of a toilet three floors below. Myrtle, I'm, I'm not wearing anything. The foam was so dense that this hardly mattered, but he had a nasty feeling that Myrtle had been spying on him from out of one of the taps ever since he had arrived. I closed my eyes when you got in. You haven't been to see me for ages. Yeah, well, I'm not supposed to come into your bathroom, am I? It's a girl's one. You didn't used to care. You used to be in there all the time. I got told off for going in there. I thought I'd better not come back after that. I see. Well, anyway, I'd try the egg in the water. That's what Cedric Diggory did. Have you been spying on him too? What'd you do? Sneak up here in the evening to watch the prefects take baths? Sometimes, but I've never come out to speak to anyone before. I'm honored. You keep your eyes shut. He made sure Myrtle had her glasses well covered before hoisting himself out of the bath, 
wrapping the towel firmly around his waist and going to retrieve the egg. Go on then, open it under the water. Harry lowered the egg beneath the foamy surface and opened it. And this time, it did not wail. A gurgling song was coming out of it. A song whose words he couldn't distinguish through the water. You need to put your head under too. Go on. Harry took a great breath and slid under the surface. And now he heard a chorus of eerie voices singing to him from the open egg in his hands. Come seek us where our voices sound. We cannot sing above the ground. And while you're searching, ponder this. We've taken what you'll sorely miss. Harry let himself float back upwards and broke the bubbly surface, shaking his hair out of his eyes. Hear it? Yeah. Come seek us where our voices sound. Hang on, I need to listen again. He sank back beneath the water. I've got to go and look for people who can't use their voices above the ground. Who could that be? Slow, aren't you? If the voices could only be heard underwater, then it made sense for them to belong to underwater creatures. Well, that's what Diggory thought. He lay there talking to himself for ages about it. Ages and ages. Nearly all the bubbles had gone. The water. Myrtle, what lives in the lake apart from the giant squid? Oh, all sorts. I sometimes go down there. Sometimes don't have any choice if someone flushes my toilet when I'm not expecting it. Does anything in there have a human voice? M Myrtle, there aren't mer people in there, are there? Ooh, very good! It took Diggory much longer than that. That's it, isn't it? The second task is to go and find the mer people in the lake and, and... But he suddenly realized what he was saying and he felt the excitement train out of him. He wasn't a very good swimmer. He never had much practice. The lake was very large and very deep and the mer people would surely live right at the bottom. Myrtle, how am I supposed to breathe? Tactless! Talking about breathing in front of me when I can't, when, when I haven't, not for ages. I remembered how touchy Myrtle had always been about being dead. Sorry, I didn't mean, I just forgot that- Oh yes, very easy to forget Myrtle's dead. Nobody missed me even when I was alive. Took them hours and hours to find my body. I know, I was sitting there waiting for them. Olive Hornby came into the bathroom. Are you in here sulking, Myrtle? Because Professor Dippet asked me to look for you. And then she saw my body. Ooh, she didn't forget it until her dying day. I made sure of that. Followed her around and reminded her I did. I remember at her brother's wedding. Harry wasn't listening. He was thinking about the Mer people's song again. We've taken what you'll sorely miss. That sounds as though they were going to steal something of his. And then, of course, she went to the Ministry of Magic to stop me from stalking her. So I had to come here and live in my toilet. Uh, well, I'm a lot further on than I was. Uh, shut your eyes again, will you? I'm getting out. He retrieved the egg from the bottom of the bath, climbed out, dried himself, and pulled on his pajamas and dressing gown again. Will you come visit me in my bathroom again sometime? Girl, Troy. Uh, see you, Myrtle. Uh, thanks for the help. Bye-bye. And as Harry put on the invisibility cloak, he saw her zoom back up the tap. Book number eight, Drama, is a full-color graphic novel by acclaimed cartoonist Raina Telgemeier. This Stonewall Honor award-winning graphic novel has been challenged for LGBTQIA content and for concerns that it goes against family values and morals. And so even though he acted like he liked me, when anybody else was around, it was like I didn't even exist. I've known Greg since second grade. He's always been thick-headed, even if he is cute. Hmm. Wait, what? When you say he's cute, do you mean like... Like, I like boys? Yeah. Oh. Um, is that cool? Is it okay that I told you? It's cool. I guess I was never really sure if anyone I knew was actually, um, gay. 
You can say it. I don't mind. Okay, so does anybody else know? Does your brother know? Jesse's the first person I ever told. Is he gay too? No. Good to know. Uh-huh. Anyway, come here. Your secret's safe with me. Thanks. Book number seven, The Handmaid's Tale, is a dystopian novel written by Canadian author Margaret Atwood and first published in 1985. This award-winning classic novel has been banned and challenged for profanity and for vulgarity and sexual overtones. I worked in a library transferring books to computer disks. Diskers, we called ourselves. It's strange now to think about having a job. All those women having jobs. It's hard to imagine now, but thousands of them had jobs, millions. It was considered the normal thing. Now it's like remembering the paper money when they still had that. You had to take those pieces of paper with you when you went shopping. Though by the time I was nine or 10, most people used plastic cards. I must have used that kind of money myself a little before everything went on the compu bank. I guess that's how they were able to do it in the way they did. If there had still been portable money, it would have been more difficult. It was after the catastrophe when they shot the president and machine guns the Congress and the army declared a state of emergency. They blamed it on Islamic fanatics at the time. That was when they suspended the Constitution. They said it would be temporary. There wasn't even any rioting in the streets. P people stayed home at night watching television, looking for some direction. Things continued in that sort of state of suspended animation for weeks, although some things did happen. Newspapers were censored and some were closed down. For security reasons, they said, the roadblocks began to appear and identify passes. Everyone approved of that since it was obvious you couldn't be too careful. They said that new elections would be held, but that it would take some time to prepare for them. The thing to do, they said, was to continue on as usual. The porno marts were shut, though, and there were no longer any feels on wheels vans. It's high time somebody did something, said the woman behind the counter at the store where I usually bought my cigarettes. Did they just close them or what? She shrugged. Who knows? Who cares? She said. She punched my copy number into the till, barely looking at it. I was a regular by then. The next morning, on my way back to the library for the day, I stopped by the same store for another pack. But when I got to the corner store, the usual woman wasn't there. Instead, there was a man, a young man. He couldn't have been more than 20. Is she sick? I said as I handed him my card. Who? He asked aggressively, I thought. The woman who's usually here. How would I know? He said. He was punching my number in studying each number, punching with one finger. He obviously hadn't done it before. Sorry, he said, the number's not valid. That's ridiculous, I said. It must be. I've got thousands in my account. I just got the statement two days ago. Try it again. You see that red light? Means it's not valid. You must have made a mistake, I said. Try it again. He shrugged and gave me a fed up smile, but he did try the number again. But there was that red light again. See, he said again, still with that smile, as if he knew some private joke he wasn't going to tell me. I did phone from the office, but all I got was a recording. The lines were overloaded. The recording said, could I please call back? After lunch, the director came into the disking room. I have something to tell you, he said. He looked terrible. We all looked up, turned off our machines. I'm sorry, he said, but it's the law. I really am sorry. I have to let you go, he said. It's the law. I have to. I have to let you all go. We're being fired? Not fired, he said. Let go. You can't work here anymore. It's the law. You can't just do that. It isn't me, he said. You don't understand. Please go now. I, I don't want any trouble. If there's trouble, the, the books might be lost. Things will be broken. He looked over his shoulder. They're outside, he said, in my office. If you don't go now, they'll come in themselves. They gave me 10 minutes. He's loopy, someone said out loud. But I could see out into the corridor and there were two men standing there in uniforms with machine guns. Just leave the machines, he said while we were getting our things together, filing out. We stood in a cluster on the steps outside the library. What was it about this that made us feel like we deserved it? When I got back to the house, nobody was there. I felt tired. I thought I should do something, take steps, but I didn't know what steps I could take. I tried phoning the bank again, but I only got the same recording. I waited a while and phoned Moira. I've been fired, I told her. I'll come over, she said. She got there after some time. Tried getting anything on your coffee card today? Yes, I said, and I told her about that. They've frozen them, she said. Mine too. Any account with an F on it instead of an M. All they needed to do is push a few buttons. We're cut off. 
Women can't hold property anymore. It's a new law. Luke can use your comp you count for you, she said. They'll transfer your number to him, or that's what they say, husband or male next of kin. By the time Luke got home, I was sitting at the kitchen table. Luke knelt beside me and put his arms around me. I heard, he said, on the car radio driving home. Don't worry, I'm sure it's temporary. You don't know what it's like, I said. I feel as if somebody cut off my feet. It's only a job, he said, trying to soothe me. I guess you'll get all my money, I said, and I'm not even dead. Hush, he said. He was still kneeling on the floor. You know I'll always take care of you. I thought, already he's starting to patronize me. Then I thought, already you're starting to get paranoid. I know, I said, I love you. Book number six, I Am Jazz, co-written by Jessica Herschel and Jazz Jennings and illustrated by Sheila McNichols, is a true story and one of the first children's books to explain transgender. This autobiographical picture book has been challenged and relocated for LGBTQIA content, for having a transgender character, and for confronting a topic that is, quote, sensitive, controversial, and politically charged. I am jazz. For as long as I can remember, my favorite color has been pink, my second favorite color is silver, and my third favorite color is green. Here are some of my other favorite things. Dancing, singing, backflips, drawing, soccer, swimming, makeup, and pretending I'm a pop star. Most of all, I love mermaids. Sometimes I even wear a mermaid tail to the pool. My best friends are Samantha and Casey. We always have fun together. We like high heels and princess gowns or cartwheels and trampolines. But I'm not exactly like Samantha and Casey. See, I have a girl brain, but a boy body. This is called transgender. I was born this way. And when I was very little, and my mom would say, you're such a good boy. I would say, no, Mama, good girl. At first, my family was confused. They always thought of me as a boy. As I got a little older, I hardly ever played with trucks or tools or superheroes, only princesses and mermaid costumes. My brothers told me this was girl stuff, but I kept right on playing. My sister always said that I was always talking to her about my girl thoughts and my girl dreams and how one day I would be a beautiful lady. Well, she would giggle and say, you're a funny kid. Sometimes my parents would let me wear my sister's dresses around the house, but whenever we went out, I had to put on my boy clothes again. And this made me mad. Still, I never gave up trying to convince them. Pretending I was a boy felt like telling a lie. Then one amazing day, everything changed. My mom and dad took me to meet a new doctor who asked me lots and lots of questions. Afterward, the doctor spoke to my parents, and I heard the word transgender for the very first time. And that night at bedtime, my parents both hugged me, and they said, we understand now. Be who you are. We love you no matter what. Well, this made me smile and smile. Mom and Dad told me that I could start wearing girl clothes to school and, and growing my hair long, and they, they even let me change my name to Jazz. Well, being jazz felt much more like being me. And mom said that being jazz would make me different from other kids at school, but that being different is okay. What's important, she said, is that I'm happy with who I am. Being jazz caused some other people to be confused too, like, like the teachers at school. At the beginning of the year, they wanted me to use the boys' bathroom and play on the boys' team in gym class, but that didn't feel normal to me at all. I was so happy when the teachers changed their minds. I can't even imagine not playing on the same team as, as Casey and Samantha and my other friends. Even today, there are kids who tease me or, or call me by a, a boy name or ignore me altogether. This makes me feel crummy. And then I remember that the kids who get to know me usually want to be my friend. They say I'm one of the nicest girls at school. I don't mind being different. Different is special. I, I think what matters most is what a person is like on, on the inside. And inside, I'm happy. I'm having fun. And I am proud. I am jazz. Book number five. 
Prince and Knight is a children's picture book illustrated by Stevie Lewis and authored by Daniel Hack. Prince and Knight has won several awards and has also been challenged and restricted for featuring gay marriage and LGBTQIA content for being, quote, a deliberate attempt to indoctrinate young children with the potential to cause confusion, curiosity, and gender dysphoria, and for conflicting with a religious viewpoint. Once upon a time, in a kingdom far from here, lived a charming prince who was handsome and sincere. His parents knew that soon it would be time he took the throne, but with a kingdom so grand, the prince could not rule alone. So the three of them set out to travel far and wide on a quest to find the prince a kind and worthy bride. The prince met many ladies, and he made them all swoon, but it was soon clear that he was singing a different tune. Thank you, he told his parents. I appreciate that you tried, but I'm looking for something different in a partner by my side. But while the royals were away, their land faced quite a scare from a dragon fast approaching, breathing fire everywhere. The prince heard the dreadful news and he raced home with all his might. To protect his precious realm, the prince was ready for a fight. Alas, before you fear our prince had to face the beast alone, along on horseback came a knight, cloaked in armor that brightly shone the dragon charged upon our heroes, thinking it had already won, but the knight had a bold idea and raised his shield to face the sun. The glare hit the shining metal, blinding the dragon's fiery eyes, but it was what the prince did next that really caught it by surprise. The prince had climbed atop the dragon and tied a rope around its head, he wrapped the cord around the neck and down the body like a thread. The plan had worked. The dragon was caught. Its body was tied and bound, but the prince up high had lost his grip and was falling to the ground. The knight below jumped on his horse and they began to race. The prince was caught and free from harm, held in the knight's embrace. You saved my life, and you saved mine, they said to one another, and in a flash to each it felt there simply was no other. The knight took off his helmet to reveal his handsome face, and as they gazed into each other's eyes, their hearts began to race. As the villagers returned, it became clear to those around that the prince's one true love had at last been surely found. The king and queen had come back too and were overwhelmed with joy. We have finally found someone who is perfect for our boy. And on the two men's wedding day, the air filled with cheer and laughter for the prince and his shining knight would live happily ever after. Book number four. Sex is a Funny Word, written by Corey Silverberg and illustrated by Fiona Smith, is a comic book for kids. This 2015 informational children's book, written by a certified sex educator, was challenged, banned, and relocated for containing LGBTQIA content and for discussing gender. Sex is a funny word, because come on, it is. Everyone has their own idea of sex. Some people think they don't know anything about it. Some people think they know everything about it. All of us have questions, and all of us have answers, too. So, what is sex? Well, that's a big question, right? Sex is a word used to describe our bodies, like male or female. Sex is something people can do with their bodies, and sex is also how you make babies. To understand sex, you also need to understand respect. You need to think of other people's feelings and the things that are important to them. Respect goes two ways. People should respect you, well, you should respect them. Trust is also important. It means you feel safe and comfortable with that person. Joy, well, 
that's a big, beautiful, happy feeling. And there's lots of ways to feel joy. And part of sex is feeling joy and pleasure. And justice. Justice is like fairness, only bigger. Once you learn about the emotional side of sex, you also need to learn about the physical side of sex. We call these in the book the middle parts. Most boys are born with a penis and a scrotum, and most girls are born with a vulva and clitoris and vagina. And everyone has nipples, by the way. But having a penis isn't what makes you a boy, and having a vulva isn't what makes you a girl. There are more than two kinds of bodies, but they call you a boy or a girl based on what they see. That might sound like the end of the story, but it's really just the beginning. You may have noticed that people often talk about relationships between men and women, as if those are the only two type of relationships they can have a crush or feel love or have sex, but they aren't. You might have heard people use the term gay or lesbian, or how about asexual or queer? Those are words that people use to describe themselves and the kinds of relationships that they have or who they have them with. Some of those words might be new to you and that's okay. If you want to learn more about them, look in the back of the book. There's a whole glossary of terms. Remember though, words are important. Like all words, the words we use to describe ourselves and our relationship can be used by others in a way that can be hurtful. It helps when you get to choose what you call yourself or what you choose to call your relationship. It helps whenever you get to define that and include trust and respect and justice in that relationship. So remember, education is empowering. Don't ban a book because it makes you feel kind of fun. Use that, use that emotion to explore. Never, ever stop learning. Book number three, A Day in the Life of Marlon Bundo, is a children's book written by Jill Twiss, illustrated by E.G. Keller, and presented by Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. A Day in the Life of Marlon Bundo has been challenged and vandalized for LGBTQIA content, political viewpoints, for concerns that it is, quote, designed to pollute the morals of its readers and for not including a content warning. My name is Marlon Bundo and I'm a bunny. I live with mom, grandma, and grandpa in an old stuffy house on the grounds of the U.S. Naval Observatory. That's because my grandpa is the vice president. His name is Mike Pence. But this story isn't going to be about him because he isn't very fun. This story is about me because I'm very fun. This is the story of my very special day. My very special day started out like every other day. I woke up all alone, and then I ate a fine bunny breakfast all alone, and I watched the news all alone. You see, sometimes old stuffy houses are also lonely. After breakfast, I hopped to the garden to look at the flowers and say, hello down there to the bugs. That is when I saw him. He was a big fluffy bunny with the floppiest floppy ears and the bushiest bushy tail. He was bunny beautiful. I was standing still, but being near him made my heart feel like my heart was still hopping. Look how hot he is. It's fierce. Totally fierce. My name is Marlon, I said, but my family calls me Botas. It's short for Bunny of the United States. It's a long story. My name is Wesley, and my family calls me Wesley, said Wesley. Wesley and I hopped together all around the garden. We hopped over daisies. We hopped over tiny carrots that weren't ready to grow up and be lunches yet. I love books. Once we had hopped through every part of the garden, we did not want to stop hopping. So we hopped right inside the old stuffy house. We hopped up and down the creaky stairs and made beautiful creaky stair music together. We hopped through the kitchen and maybe left a few bunny prints. We hopped through very boring meetings with very boring people. Like this person and these people. It was a very good hop. It was the best hop. And I realized something. When I hopped with Wesley, my old stuffy house didn't feel lonely anymore. Aww. At the end of our hop, I said, Wesley, I don't want to hop without you ever again. And Wesley said, that's funny, because I never want to hop without you, Marlon Bundo, ever again. And we both said, we will get married and hop together forever.
ever. Hello, everyone, we said to all the animals in the garden. Hello, all of you. We are getting married so we can hop together forever. Hooray, said Phil and Dennis the Bugs and Pumpernickel, who is a badger, and Scooter, who is a turtle, and Dill Prickle, who is a hedgehog, and Mr. Paws, who is a very good dog. Hooray, said all our friends, because that is what friends say. Hooray! Wait, said a scary voice. You can't get married. We looked around and saw that the scary voice was coming from the stink bug. Let me tell you a little bit about the stink bug. The stink bug was in charge. He was important. None of the other animals could quite work out why he was in charge or why he was important, but he was. And that meant that he made the rules. That meant that all the animals listened to him, even though he was, and this is true, very stinky. Boy bunnies don't marry boy bunnies. Boy bunnies have to marry girl bunnies. But this is the bunny I love, said Wesley. And this is the bunny I love said me, Marlon Bundo. Just being next to Wesley made me a little braver. Too bad, said the stink bug, and I am the stinkiest and I am important. I am the stinkiest and I am in charge. Boy bunnies marry girl bunnies. Girl bunnies marry boy bunnies. This is the way it's always been. You are different, and different is bad. The other animals whispered nervously among themselves. Pumpernickel, who was a badger, came forward. I am different too, he said. I ate my sandwiches crust first. I am different too, said Mr. Paws, who was a very good dog. Sometimes I sniff butts, and I don't know why. There he is. He's cute as a button. Everyone is different, and different is not bad, said Scooter, who is a turtle. Different is special. Wait, said Mr. Paws, who is a very good dog, and also a very smart dog. Wait a minute. We get to decide who is in charge. We get to decide who is important. We can vote. And on this very special day, all of the animals voted on who they wanted to have in charge. They chose not, not the, the stink, stink bug. bug. Hooray, said me, Marlon Bundo. Hooray, said Wesley. Hooray, Hooray said, said all our friends. friends. Because this is what friends say, mm -hmm. isn't it? It is. No, boom the stink bug. Boy bunnies can't marry boy bunnies. You're not in charge. <laughs> Bye. Bye. So, Wesley and I got married. We ate and drank and danced the hokey pokey. Dill Prickle was especially good. Look how gorgeous Cute. they all are. So gorgeous. Love that. After we ate, we drank, and we danced, and we went home together. We have to get some sleep, Marlin. Tomorrow we leave on our bunny moon. Because it doesn't matter if you love a girl bunny or a boy bunny, or eat your sandwiches backwards or forwards. Stink bugs are temporary. Love, love is, is forever. forever. Book number two, Beyond Magenta, Transgender Teens Speak Out, is a book of detailed interviews by author and photographer Susan Cooklin. Beyond Magenta has won multiple awards, and it has also been challenged for LGBTQIA content, for concerns over, quote, its effect on any young people who would read it, and for concerns that it was sexually explicit and biased. When I was eight, I started taking karate and boxing. I remember how much I liked punching the heck out of the boys. I never wanted to fight little girls. It felt weird. I knew I was better than the girls, and I wanted more of a challenge. One time, I got a cut on my face. My dad saw it. Oh, I don't like seeing you get punched, he said, and it made me stop. Instead, my mom forced me to take dancing. How am I to go? No, I would hold on to the body and let me cry my eyes out. I don't want to wear spandex. No, I just cried. When it came time for the recital, she begged me. Please just do it. I promise I will never make you do it again. Just do the recital. I did it. I felt like crap. I wore a sexy little red dress and bows in my hair and I had a pose. I just wanted to cry. Puberty is reality. Once Jesse started puberty, reality came crashing down. There was one thing he did not want. Breasts. I was starting to develop breasts. Oh crap. 
I hate bras. Never like buying them. It wasn't just looks. It's the way people treated girls. I guess people have questions about me. I was questioning me too. I wasn't sure what I was, so I tried to make people think I was straight. I tried to be a big girly girl just to fit in. No matter how pretty I looked, I felt uncomfortable. I felt like I wasn't right in a physical sense. I have a problem with that clip of girls I was in. They were the prettiest girls in school. The conceited clip. We're the prettiest. We're the most popular. They try to push me. You should wear this. You should wear that. It wasn't me. When I was with them, I'd say, oh, I think he's so cute. But what I really thought was, oh my God, what am I saying? I think she's so cute. I had long hair and was trying to act like a girl. When I told them I wanted to cut my hair, they wanted to know why. Wait, you're not my mom. I said, why are you asking me this? At one point they asked, are you gay? I said, I didn't know. And they started saying things that were kind of mean. No, no, kind of, it was mean. I can't believe you're that kind of person. My close friend said glaring at me, like I was from another planet. Why would you do that? Tell me if you are. I said, you say you're my friend. Why can't you accept me for who I am? How can you say those things to me? How could I call these people my closest friends when they didn't even know who I was? That's not the definition of friend. A friend is someone you can share things with. You can be yourself around. If you had a crush on someone, you can tell your friend. I could not do that with those girls. Finally, I say goodbye to that clip and I ate lunch alone. I was hurt. It was kind of lonely. During that time, I thought, am I really a lesbian? I was scared and unsure about myself. Before I came out, I had to make sure that this is what I wanted for myself, that this is who I wanted to be. By ninth grade, I really got into sports. I played basketball at the time on the girls varsity team. I tried to dress pretty, but I felt so out of place in the skirt. Every time I looked in the mirror, I felt like I shouldn't be wearing them. I'm not ladylike, that's not me. Now when I show people a picture of me as a girl, no one believes me. In the picture, I was wearing lipstick and a dress. Everyone says, that's your sister. No, I swear to God, it's me. During Jesse's early high school years, he didn't know what the word transgender meant. He was only questioning his sexual orientation. He thought, hey, if you like women and you're a woman, then you're a lesbian. He didn't know about gender diversity because he was young. On the one hand, he wanted to please his family and be accepted by society. On the other hand, he knew something was not right. At first, I thought maybe there's something psychologically wrong with me because I was thinking this way, because I was feeling this way. Am I abnormal? I was a little insecure. I didn't have anyone to talk to. I had to work through it on my own. I asked myself, well, what's wrong with liking the same sex? Is it sinful? Why does society view it as something so bad, so taboo? Love is love, and whoever you feel you love, express it. It's okay. It's not like I'm a crook or I'm a robber doing harmful things to people. I'm just trying to be who I am. Book number one, George by Alex Gino, is a children's novel about a young transgender girl. Written for elementary age children, this Lambda Literary Award winner has been banned, challenged, restricted, and hidden to avoid controversy for LGBTQIA plus content and a transgender character because schools and libraries should not, quote, put books in a child's hand that require discussion, end quote, for sexual references and for conflicting with a religious viewpoint and, quote, traditional family structure. Kelly and George found a quiet spot at the far end of the fence to practice. George knew her lines and didn't need to look at the sheet once as she spoke but her heart thumped heavily and she spoke too quickly, swallowing the final words of each line. She glanced behind her whenever Kelly spoke to make sure no one was watching. Kelly frowned when they were done. That wasn't your best performance. I know. Do you want to go through it again? No! A few nearby third graders turned their heads in the direction of George's shout. She lowered her voice. I mean, no. It's too open. I'll be all right when I'm alone with Ms. Udell. I still don't know what the big deal is. So you want to play a girl on stage. It's not like you actually want to be a girl. George's face paled. The air grew hot around her. What's wrong? George opened her mouth, but there were no words, so she closed it again. She started to giggle nervously. <laughs> George's charged <laughs> laughter filled the air. 
<laughs> okay, well, soon Kelly was chuckling too, though she didn't know why. <laughs> George's laughter grew frantic and she felt lightheaded. So, <laughs> what are we laughing about? Are you serious? Of course I'm serious. I am always serious, except for, you know, when I'm not serious, but right now I'm serious. But you said it. George didn't know whether to be relieved or upset that Kelly didn't see that she was a girl. All I said was, what did I say, George? I mean, I've always thought of myself as a funny person, but I didn't think that I was such a good comedian that I could say something that funny without knowing it. George opened her mouth, but she couldn't say the only words that blared through her brain. I'm a girl! Are you nervous about the audition? Don't be. My dad says that men performing in non-traditional gender roles is good for feminism. Can we not talk about it anymore? Somehow it was worse that Kelly thought it was no big deal that George wanted to be Charlotte in the play than if she had said it was a terrible idea. I congratulate you all for your patience. The time has finally come to see how you fare as actors and actresses. Today you are each reading Charlotte's or Wilbur's lines. If you're interested in trying out, I will give you a card with a number on it. The number will dictate the order of your audition. Girls first, then boys. You will read only your part. I will read the lines of the other characters. Ms. Udell asked the boys who wished to audition to raise their hands. George joined them, lifting her hand just to the height of her head. Ms. Udell counted six blue index cards and passed them out. George was number six. Last, Ms. Udell then distributed nine pink cards to girls who raised outstretched fingers and mouthed numbers to each other. Janelle stood, waving a card with the number one on it. She held the door open for Ms. Udell, who pushed her chair into the hallway where they both disappeared. George tried to bury her mind in her homework. Janelle popped her head in through the doorway, and Kelly bounced up and rushed out of the room. Soon, she came beaming back into the classroom. Number three, you're up. Kelly gave George a thumbs up sign. Eventually, Ms. Udell came in to announce that it was time for the boys to take their turns. Finally, it was George's turn. In the hallway, Ms. Udell sat in the blocky wooden chair. You don't have your sheet, George. Don't need him. Well, that's a good sign. It means you must have practiced. Uh, but do speak up. Before Ms. Udell could say anything else, George closed her eyes and began. The first words rushed out of her mouth, but then she slowed into the cadence she had practiced. She felt herself as Charlotte and gave each word her full attention as it left her tongue. George reached the end of Charlotte's monologue and was ready for the dialogue with Wilbur that followed. But George didn't hear her cue. She opened her eyes. George, what was that? I, but there were no words to finish the sentence. I, I, was that supposed to be some kind of joke? Because it wasn't very funny. It wasn't a joke. I want to be Charlotte. You know I can't very well cast you as Charlotte. I have too many girls who want the part. Besides, imagine how confused people would be. Now, if you're interested in being Wilbur, that's a possibility. Or maybe Templeton. He's a funny guy. No, thanks. I just... I want it. Okay, then. For now, we need to get into the room to get ready to go. Would you hold the door for me? Ms. Udell pushed her chair back into the classroom, shaking her head. George muttered to herself as she loaded her math book into her bag. Stupid body, stupid brain, stupid boys and stupid girls, stupid everything. When Ms. Udell called her row, George hoisted her bag onto her back and shuffled over to the boys' line, still staring at the ground. 